previously here on Tiny Basic Computers on youtube.com forward slash Wi-Fi Sheep, I introduced you to the prototype colour version of our 8-bit DIY home build computer. Well today we have a new exciting build, one of the simplest yet most capable. Welcome back to Tiny Basic Computers, the homemade 8 bit programmable computer series from youtube.com forward slash Wi Fi Sheep, where we're building easy to assemble, low cost, real programmable computers. So, in this episode, which is part 10, I'll show you a new and really simple Tiny Basic build, which not only incorporates the new four color hex ROMs but will also work with the original 3.0 Alpha Hex ROMs available for free on our Facebook group. We've been really pleased to welcome PCBWay.com, your one-stop solution as our title sponsor and supporter for this and many other projects here on Wi-Fi Sheep. And PCBWay are ready to help and support you too in your own maker journey. Just take a look here at PCBWay.com forward slash projects at all the amazing and diverse things people are creating with PCBWay's wide range of production tools and services, such as 3D printing, injection molding, CNC machine tooling, sheet metal fabrication, and of course, turnkey PCB manufacturing. And PCBWay even have their own product store with hundreds of really cool and useful items, which can be purchased like a regular online retailer or using PCBWay's credit bean system given away as free gifts to customers of PCBWay's production services and products. PCBWay.com really are a truly fantastic partner to have for your maker journey needs. So don't miss out. Sign up for your free account today at PCBWay.com. Details and links are in the description. So up until now, this is an example of the sort of tiny basic computer we've been building on these solderless breadboards. And here is a blank breadboard just for comparison. So these are 890 pin or sockets, I think. That's the size of the average breadboard that we have been using for the project. However, just take that away. We today will be using these, which are half the size. Now these, I think, are 300 pin or thereabouts. And you can see they're clearly half the size of the normal breadboards that we use. We're also, for this project, going to need a minimal amount of parts, actually far less than anything else we've built so far. So what you're going to need is a packet of jumper cables. You can pick these up quite cheap off AliExpress, eBay. And they come in sort of pre-cut, colour-coded jumpers. And I've already selected what I need. So all we need for this is one long or medium-long grey. This one's a bit chewed up, but it'll be fine one small blue, one small red, and seven small grey. And that's basically it for jumpers. We're going to use the Arduino Nano and have one here. Now these are clones of the actual proper Arduino Nano. However, be warned that of late, not all clones are the same. There's a batch of these coming out of China that look identical to this, but don't use the Atmega 328P. They use the Atmega 328PB. I did a video on this. Unfortunately, at the moment, I don't have a way of flashing the compiled hex ROMs to the latter variant. So you're really going to have to make sure that if you're going to use these nano boards, that they are the correct Atmega 328P variants. The only way to be absolutely sure is to buy the proper Arduino branded ones that are more of a turquoisey teal type colour, but they are considerably more expensive than the clones. I do want to assure you I am working on a solution for this, I just haven't got one at the moment. So that's what we're going to use. Now what I will do is I'm going to flash two clone boards because I'll also show you using the free uh, download version of Tiny Basic. So yes, this works with the free hex ROMs as well. Uh, you'll only get black and white output, but it does work. So I am making this project accessible 
for those of you, uh, if you're using the free ROMs, you do need to join the Facebook group at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash WFS Tiny Basic. And you can download the file from there. So before we get any further, let's look at flashing the hex ROMs to these Arduino Nanos. So at this point, the Arduino Nano needs to be connected via USB to a PC running Windows 7 or later. You may also require the CH340 drivers if using clone Arduino Nano boards. All these can be sourced online or are included in our Tiny Basic Computers Patreon toolkit. The process of flashing these hex ROMs to an Arduino Nano is identical for both. So for this demonstration, I'll use the free build, but it's identical for what you do for the version 4 color. So the first thing to do is to extract the zip. And you can tell by my messy desktop, I generally just dump things straight on the desktop. So we'll extract on the desktop. Okay, and that gives you a folder. And inside you've got the two sets of hex ROMs. So you've got hex ROMs with and without bootloaders. You've also got the serial terminals. So basically we want to install this hex ROM here. So to do that, and I have to stress, you have to be on Windows 7 or later for this to work, is we're gonna go into Xloader and we'll load Xloader up. And we need to select the file, which would be by navigating through to our directory. And we'll go uh, tiny basic uh, with 3.0 uh, with bootloader so you want this file here make sure on the correct com port com port 3 which we are change the baud rate to 115 200 and click to upload and there you go see the upload is successful and that's the process you would do either for the color build or if you've got just the free part of our Facebook group and you've got the free hex ROMs. Okay, so with that done, we've got one with the Patreon based color kernel and we've got one with the uh, standard version 3.0 alpha, uh, the free kernel. So we can use both of those. Now for the video side of the system, in the previous projects, we've used either another Arduino Nano or a standalone Atmega 328P chip. But for this, we're going to use a Raspberry Pi. This is what we did, if I just bring it back into shot, with the color version. You can see here, it had a Raspberry Pi Zero, basically acting as the video driver and USB driver. Many of you commented on that, as I said in the intro, that it's all good and well and all that, but you can't get hold of Raspberry Pis, and those of you that have got Pis don't really want to chop them up, which is a shame, because that was kind of the point of the Raspberry Pi originally, but I understand in these modern times, things have changed. So what I've been doing is looking for an alternative source. We're still going to stick with a Pi, and I've actually been attempting to stockpile, because I need a few myself, these, which are the original Raspberry Pi Model A or Model Bs. These are the 2011-2012 boards. So you can see I've been uh, buying a couple up, so I've been numbering them. So these are the boards that no one really wants. And as a result, there's plenty floating around on online marketplaces such as eBay. And used or refurbished, they're going for, you know, relatively small prices. Um, basically, these original boards for Linux and desktop and all that are quite slow now. And they don't have USB 3 and Wi-Fi and things like that. However, for our purpose, for what we want to do, which is purely to run these as a dumb terminal, they're perfect. They're absolutely perfect. Both the 250 meg and the 512 meg versions are absolutely fine. As I said, we can pick these up plenty of dozen because no one wants them. I appreciate the minute I do this video, suddenly these are all skyrocketing in price, but... There's plenty of this stock floating around. They're not made anymore, but they're not going to disappear overnight. So we've probably got a good few years you'll be able to get hold of these relatively easy and cheap. So I just thought they're the perfect board for what we want. Also, if we use these original Model Bs, or Model As for that matter, they have the full composite video out on one side and HDMI out on the other. Just a reminder, they do use the full size SD cards. So although this is empty, you might, if you're going to use micro SD cards, then you're going to need the adapter and then you can pop your micro SD card in there. 
and they work absolutely fine. So this is kind of what we'll use to drive our video side of this build. Now there is one more key component we're going to need for this to work. So the Raspberry Pi is going to form a big chunk of the project. It's not going to drive the computer. It's still an 8-bit system driven from the Arduino. So it's still at Mega 32AP driven. But we now have an issue of a different voltage drop. So we've got two line voltages going on. We've got 5 volts over here. But the Pi on its GPIO is only compatible with 3.3 volts. Meaning if we try and drive a 5 volt signal from here and put it into here, we can damage and fry the Pi. So we need to drop the voltage down using something called a level shifter. And you can pick these up very cheap. I have one here. So let's open this up. And it's a tiny little board and you get some pin header now unfortunately I haven't seen anybody selling these pre-soldered so I have one here which I've made up a little bit earlier and it does mean you do have to solder the legs now it's probably really hard to make this out on camera but I just want to show you how the pins on this work so the top are what's called high and the bottom is low and there's four channels so there's HV1, HV2, HV is the common voltage, ground, and then HV3, HV4, and the same for the low. So the one that's just LV and HV is where we need to put 5 volts and 3.3 volts, and ground is the recruitment of negative. The remaining channels are what we put the high channel on one side. So for example, 5 volts HV1 digital signal we would put up there, and then it would pass through as a lower voltage 3.3 digital signal off LV1. And we can also run the other way. So these are actually inverted. So you can run back and forth through the level shifter. If that doesn't make sense, don't worry. It'll all come very clear in a moment. But I just thought I wanted to show you very quickly how these work. As I said before, unfortunately, I haven't seen any that have come pre-soldered. So you do need to be able to solder the header on. It's quite a simple job to do. It's not difficult. Just have to make sure that you don't bridge the solder between the pins so each pin is separate to its neighbor next thing we need is we need female to male four-way jumper cable and you can buy these in a ribbon and just split off what you need so it needs to have pins on one end and sockets on the other end this is because we need to bridge from the breadboard to the Raspberry Pi GPIO the next bit is optional which is a capacitor and you can use the ceramic disc 104 ceramic disc capacitors or you can use an electrolytic and this is a 10 uf 50 volt uh, electrolytic capacitor if you use electrolytics you have to remember that they can only go in one way and the stripe for negative is on one side and the legs are normally a different uh, length i've actually cut these legs straight but that's fine we've got a stripe which will tell us which way that goes again this part here just the electrolytic or if you've got an orange disc ceramic capacitor, they are completely optional. You don't have to use this piece. It just helps to smooth out the circuit uh, and any voltage drops or interference, it can help smooth out so you don't get line chatter between the Pi and the Arduino. And finally, a SD or micro SD card. This needs to be blank and formatted to PC FAT or FAT32 format. If you're using the original Raspberry Pis, then you will need an adapter if you're using a micro card, and that will adapt it up to a full size SD that we need uh, for using with the original Pis. I did forget to mention actually that if you do have a slightly later Pi B Plus revision, Pi 2, this is a Pi 2, or up to Pi 3 or Pi 3B. They'll also work absolutely fine. The GPIO pin, as you can see between the two, is longer on the later models, but all the pins this way around are identical. So you can wire this up exactly the same as you would the originals. The reason I'm not so keen on the later ones is the composite, although it's there, you have to have a breakout uh, adapter to break out into sound and get the video off that. And it's just a bit of a pain. If you're gonna use HDMI only, then these are absolutely fine for that and they'll work just as well. So the next thing we need to do is copy to the SD card something called Pi GFX. Let me show you. 
So we need to head over to the PyGFX GitHub and the link to that will be in the description to the video. And here it is. And basically it gives you all the files. So it's an open source program. So it gives you all the files you can actually compile it yourself if you want. And it gives you a brief introduction to how it all works. And what we need to do is we need to hit bin and we need to download the contents of this folder. And the best way I can see to do that is to just hit code and download zip. It's a tiny, tiny file, so it'll download to your machine. What you'll end up with is a file like this called PyGFX master zip, which will just unzip. By the way, I'm on a Mac for this, but the process I can assure you is virtually identical on Linux and PC systems. And here is all the files. So it's inside bin. And these are the core files pre-compiled for us that we need to make the Pi side of our system work. So the next thing we need to do is we need to insert a blank SD or micro SD card, depending on what Pi you're using. And here is one ready. And this needs to be in MS-DOS FAT32 or FAT16 format, which this one is. Now, unlike other Raspberry Pi images, you don't have to use any flashing or uh, burn mount agents or anything to actually write SD card images. We can literally click and drag or Control-C, Control-V on PC and just copy the file straight across. Now, although that should be enough for it to work, I have had it with versions of the Pi I've used that it doesn't like booting on just those files. So if you're a member of our Wi-Fi sheet Patreon, and you have access to the Tiny Basic Computers Toolkit. There is now a folder in there called TBC Pi GFX. And inside is my version, which contains the additional files. Now, these files, if you want to know where to obtain them, they are straight off a Raspbian Linux boot. You don't need the actual Linux part of the OS because we're running Burr Metal, but we do need things like config files and boot boot code dot bin and things like that which are missing on this version so again all you'd have to do here is just copy and paste if you're unsure literally just mount a raspberry sd card image copy the, the front off the image and then just paste the files straight into an sd card with these additional kernel files which will replace so many others so the important ones here is the dot img and recovery 7 dot img and that should now work Okay, so that's our SD card sorted out. So I think we pretty much got everything we need. As I mentioned, I'm using two nanos. You only need one. I've just got the free and the Patreon color builds and we'll swap these over and I'll show you how this works. So let's just take one of the nanos out of the way for a minute and I'll show you the build. It's probably one of the simplest builds we've ever done. So the breadboard, make sure that plus is at the top so it's the correct way around. We need to take our nano board and we're going to place that roughly in the middle, making sure it's over the gap between the two sides. And the, the first pins by the USB are right up flush against here. So you don't want it back that way or anything. So it needs to go in right up against the edge. And don't be scared to push the board down. Make sure you get good connection and it's in. Some of these boards I've noticed of late have been very stiff. So you might find that you actually have to sort of get another component or something and just poke holes just to open up the uh, metal connectors underneath because some of the later ones I said have been very stiff of late. Okay, so that's in, which is great. And next we're going to take our level shifter, making sure we've got this the correct way around. So the H labeled uh, connectors at the top, L is at the bottom, and we're gonna pop that in roughly about that. Again, we need to have it bridging this gap in the breadboard. So let's sort of get that in. Okay, excellent. So because we're dealing with two voltages, we're going to reserve five volts up here and 3.3 .3 volts down here. And whatever we do, we do not want to mix the two voltages. So the first thing we'll do is we'll put the voltage and ground lines in. Now, most Arduino nanos, including the clones, are able to generate 3.3 volts. And there's a pin next to D13. So the D13 runs from the end, and then right next to it is a pin called 3V3. And that's your 3.3 volt out. So we'll take the small blue jumper and we'll connect that to the power rail 
on the bottom. So now 3 volts is going to come out onto this rail here, marked in red. We can now add the ground. So ground is the equivalent of a battery of minus, and the ground can be shared with everything regardless of the voltage. So we're going to use mostly going to use these grey jumpers here, and anything marked G N D or ground, we're going to connect up to the blue rail. So there's one there. one here so one on the top and the bottom and we also need to connect the grounds on the level shifter board and again there's one on the top and the bottom okay so that's looking great so far so now what we're going to do is we're going to start applying some of the voltages so remember i said five volts up here 3.3 down here so again we're going to use another gray jumper now, again, the colour would be ideal if these were different colours, but it's the size that matters here. So we need to make sure we've got someone that's the correct size. So we're going to connect the HV line up here to the 5 volt power rail. So that goes in like that. And the LV, which is the low voltage power rail, we're going to connect to red down here. OK. Finally, what we need to do is, because we're going to bring 5 volts into the board, probably about here, um, we need to connect to the plus 5V pin, which is down here. So to do that, I'm going to take the longer grey jumper. And again, yours are probably not going to be as bent up as mine. Uh, but we're going to bend that, and we're going to just bend into a sort of J shape. If you can see that. Bend the end down. And we're going to connect into the 5 volt rail up here and we'll connect into the 5 plus pin which is on any of the row down here and that will take 5 volts down and actually power into the Arduino Nano so that's going to be very important if you don't do that get it in the right place you won't get power into the Arduino Nano now, the final thing to do is we need to connect the TX and RX serial lines. Now, this is really important. This is how the Arduino Nano is going to talk to the Raspberry Pi video terminal. And we need to take these signals through the level shifter because they're going to come out as 5 volt logic signals and we need to drop them to 3.3 volt logic signals. So to do that, we're going to use the H1 and H2 channels and we'll go TX which is the first one here, and we'll bridge TX to HV1. And we, again, we use a small grey jumper for that. And then we're going to use the red jumper to go from RX to HV2. Okay, and there we are. We're just going to check the wiring to make sure everything is in the correct position. And it all looks good. Finally, at this point, if you want to, you can add your electrolytic capacitor. Again, not needed, but you can add one. So add it to the 5 volts line. And remember, the stripe is negative. And what we're going to do is going to bridge positive and negative on the 5 volts rail. So we're going to go that way around. The stripe face is blue. And we can sort of put that kind of roughly about there it's better to put it nearer where the power source is so in the middle of the board about there on the power rail is absolutely fine and that believe it or not is the bulk of the main build done right so let's turn our attention to this Raspberry Pi we're going to use and remember we've got the SD card sorted now depending on which version you're going to use will depend on what settings you need for the Pi so We'll start with the free version, which you can get on our Facebook group. And the free version works at 9600 baud, which means we need to take this SD card, put it back into a PC or Linux machine, whatever we've got, and we need to make a change to the config file. We need to find this file, which is pygfx.txt. Don't worry if you haven't got these files underneath. These are just specialists for the Mac. So it should just be this file here. And we need to open that in whatever text editor you've got. Uh, this will probably just open in the uh, text edit default for Mac. 
and basically here at the very top we've got UART BARD rating and you can see here by default it's set to 115200. That is fine if you want to run the four color build. However, if you want to run the 3.0 alpha free build from our Facebook group, you need to change this down to 9600 and just make sure you do save your file. And that's it, that's all you have to do. So if you okay, so we made that change to the config file and this should now be set up ready to go. So let's put this into the pipe. Now remember, these cards stick out quite a long way on the originals, but that's fine. And we're going to place the pie that way around. So we've got the jumpers on the top here. Now this is where our jumper cable comes in. And this is probably one of the more crucial parts. We need to make sure we get the wiring correct. So we're going to jump power from the Rosy Pi. And we're going to jump it to power. And also send the signals to the Arduino Nano. Which will in turn be able to send signal back to the Pi. So we'll start off with, I'm going to use a uh, red and grey cables here. Your cables are probably going to differ in size or colour, depending on what you've used. So in my case, I want to pick up 5 volts, which is going to be uh, red. So that's the first top pin here. So pin 1 is the first of the bottom. And we want first of the top. So that's going to be 5 volts. The pin next to it, we skip. The next one along is ground and that's where I'm going to put the brown. Okay, so can you see that? 5 volts on pin 2, 3, 4, 5 and then 6 which is the next one along on the top. So you skip one, it's next one along is ground. And these two cables we're going to plug 5 volts into the top rail and ground next to it onto the bottom rail. Okay, so that's the power done. The remaining two are actually our TX and RX signals. So that's the serial UART that this tiny basic system uses. It's for transmitting data between the two boards. This is how the computer or the um, CPU side, the nano CPU side is gonna know that the Pi terminal is doing something and the Pi terminal in turn is gonna listen for what the Arduino kicks out. So on any Pi, it's the next two pins from ground are TX and RX and you go TX to RX, RX to TX. So, if I use yellow as my TX, I go straight in on the top row next to the brown. So again, I hope you can see that next pin along. And yellow here is gonna go on to number two, LV2, and we're just gonna plug it in there. So it's gonna go transmit through from LV2 to HV2 through the red wire and in to RX0, so TX to RX. Now the next pin is RX and that goes straight in. And you can probably guess it goes RX to TX, which in our case we'll use LV1. So I'm gonna plug that in there and it goes LV1 to HV1 and into, or out in this case, to TX. So transmit comes out of here, through the orange cable into receive, and when the Pi transmits back, it comes out from the yellow cable, through the level shifter, and into receive this side. So it's transmit to receive, receive to transmit. And that fundamentally is it. That is how simple this build is. Now for this to work, I'm going to use a Raspberry Pi 2 power supply. You can use a Raspberry Pi 3 supply, uh, not the 4s because the 4s are USB-C and we want the micro USB connector. Uh, so this is 5 volts, 2 amps, which is fine. So plug that in and that'll go for the mains for the supply. So this power supply is going to power the Pi. It's also going to power the whole tiny basic Arduino setup. We can then take full advantage of if we want to use composite or HDMI. So here we are, here's a full size HDMI. We can clip that straight in and we can get a nice clean HDMI signal out and we can take that off to a modern monitor or display. One of the huge advantages of this system is that it doesn't require the use of a PS2 protocol keyboard. This was a problem with the previous builds that even though we may have used a USB socket, it wasn't USB compatible, it needed a USB keyboard with PS2 protocols. 
and there was no way of knowing which keyboards did or didn't, and it was very annoying. I have here a really mini Keysonic keyboard. It's a bit grimy. It's had, it's had this um, rubber coating on it, which unfortunately is sort of uh, disintegrated over time. But anyway, this little keyboard is USB only, so it never worked with the original Tiny Basic system. However, it should work with this system because the Raspberry Pi, as part of the Pi GFX terminal, is actually going to run a burr metal USB driver. So I should be able to plug any standard, even an Apple USB type keyboard, just into the Pi, and that will drive the keyboard as well as the display and communicate with the Arduino Nano. Okay, so one final check over just to make sure our cabling is correct. You must make sure you do this. Mainly it's to make sure you haven't got five volts and three volts in the wrong place. It's looking okay. So we should now be able to power up. That's looking promising. So we've got the Raspberry Pi has powered up and you can see we've actually got power here on the Arduino Nano. So that's looking fantastic. So let's hop over to the capture card and let's see if it booted. So this is what you should see on the screen. And it's the sort of startup kernel for uh, Pi GFX. It's not Linux. This is running as a burr metal um, kernel. And it should find the USB keyboard. It says USB keyboard found. And now it says waiting for UART data. And there's the speed 9600. Um, basically, if you are running with the free kernel from our Facebook group, it's not really designed to run with this. It will work, but it's not designed. So the thing will sit here and hang until we reset the Arduino Nano, which I'm just going to do now. So the little button here on the Nano for reset, if I hit that, there we go. It now launches and there is the basic interpreter. Now using our USB keyboard, we can now use it as we would before. Bearing in mind that some keyboards have the num lock stuck on, so make sure you turn that off. Let's just ask a memory, there we are. And there's a little bit of uh, something in memory, so let's just have a quick look at eList, see what's in memory. Okay, a tiny one, one line program, just telling us what the value of uh, A is. So E uh, chain to run that. There you go, zero, of course. So. This works and it works pretty much as we've shown in all previous videos, but you see you get a much larger screen resolution and this is outputting HDMI. This will also then output in composite, so it's compatible with all your composite monitors you've been using before and you will get a similar text resolution, which is far greater and far bigger than what we had previous. The only thing to remember with this version is if you type something in and then hit delete, it will appear to delete things but that delete is not actually valid. So if I, for example, type some gobbledygook, try and delete it, and think, okay, I've deleted it, then type in a valid command like mem, it will still error out because although the terminal side is accepting a delete, the tiny basic side, so that's the kernel side on the Arduino Nano, isn't, and it's not designed or set up on this build to use that. Also, you are in this black and white text-only mode. Um, things like CLS don't work here either. Uh, basically it's the bare minimum but it is usable and it will allow you to get a better resolution terminal and you can now use USB. So I've now swapped the Arduino Nano boards over so this is now loaded with the Tiny Basic 4 Color which is the Patreon build available as part of our Patreon toolkit at patreon.com forward slash Wi-Fi sheep. This is the color build that's actually designed for this rig. I've not changed any of the setup other than I have changed the baud rate over on the SD card. The color system needs to run at 115200, not 9600, as in the free black and white systems. So that's something to bear in mind. You need to make sure you are running the correct baud rate. So watch what happens when I boot up the four color system. So the terminal loads in. And you'll notice how it doesn't get stuck. It's able to load straight into Tiny Basic Computers for Color. And um, this is the Patreon Edition version, which is version 4.02a. And you'll also notice in the memory log, we've squeezed out an extra few bytes of RAM. So we are one byte short of a full one, two, four 
of available memory. So the EEPROM there has got uh, EEPROM is reading as 1042 so 41k. So again I can use the keyboard and again I've just done exactly the same thing which is I haven't turned an unlock off on this keyboard. This is only an issue with this particular keyboard it won't probably won't affect you but you did notice I can now properly backspace and if I type something the instruction is valid this time. So unlike the version 3, the free version 3, version 4 does actually accept the backspace and that does work absolutely fine and is completely valid. So I don't know when you do that. But you'll notice actually if we look at the memory there's only 361 bytes available and that's because I preloaded a little demo program into this version which is available as part of the Patreon toolkit under the four color uh, folder or directory and if we go e list there is the basic for it and we can go e chain and it's some demos and we've got a color test and something called the singing at so i can tap one for color test and on this particular version it will redraw the 256 color palette over and over again in a sort of scrolling motion the version you get, I may take the scrolling element off, so it may just read and then end program, because that's a little bit annoying, but quite good if you are showcasing this, and I had this out the other day showcasing it at an event, and you just want something on the screen rolling. But that shows you the color capabilities of this version of our Tiny Basic system. So I'm just gonna hit escape and that will break the program. And let's do a reset, so I'm just gonna hit reset. And the system takes a moment to reboot. And it says system rebooting, one moment. And there we are, we're back up again, no problem. Let's e-chain back in. And I'll show you the singing at. So I hit two. And you see a string of turquoisey blue ats appearing on the screen. Now, another feature of this kernel is that it does have the ability to in-key which is where you can t program keys that when they're pressed within basic, it does something. So the triangle brackets for left and right, you can see that actually I can actually draw the, uh, if you like, the character back and forth and it changes color as it moves up and down the screen. Now, if we'd attached a speaker to, I think it's D5 on the nano board and we'd grounded it, or a buzzer, which you can perfectly do, you'd actually get tones coming out. This is sound compatible, we just haven't added a sound circuit to this build. But this shows you where we're going with this kernel, that you will actually be able to, for example, control a character or a block or something on the screen, which is the beginnings of being able to do on-screen video games with our system, be it very simple ones. And again, I can hit escape, and we hit escape again, that will break the program. You can also CLS, so you can clear the screen and we've also got commands for color so f col is foreground color and i could say zero and i'll give me a, a black and i could say uh, b col background um oh i don't know what's 14. there you go so then if i cls we can clear the screen into that color mode and as you've seen with the color test you've got a choice of 256 colors available and um, that is the basics of how to build a very simple but very elegant tiny basic computers color system and it's also a great example of how to recycle and reuse an early issue raspberry pi especially in this day and age where raspberry pi is difficult to get hold of because we're just running it as a terminal, it doesn't matter. It doesn't need to be a powerful Raspberry Pi. You see it's perfectly capable of working alongside and it creates such an elegant and simple computing system that also fixes so many problems. If you're thinking about joining us on this project with this build, then it really is a great place to start, either with our full color Patreon version or the free 3.0 Alpha build, which is on the Tiny Basic Computers Facebook group. Visit facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash WFS Tiny Basic for more, including pictorial diagrams for this build. If you want to help support this channel and gain access to our Tiny Basic Toolkit, which is upgraded regularly and now contains the version of four color ROMs, you can by visiting patreon.com forward slash Wi Fi Sheep. That's patreon.com forward slash Wi Fi Sheep 
or follow links in the description to this video. And before I go, and if you're watching this in late October 2022, a quick and final reminder. On November the 5th and 6th, 2022, I'm back exhibiting at the Cambridge Retro Computing Festival. This time it is a fully open and packed event showcasing all things computing and gaming. I will be bringing a few things not seen here on the channel so far and of course the latest builds from our Tiny Basic Computers project as seen in this video. So as always it's a really great day out. I'm there for both Saturday and Sunday and I will really enjoy meeting so many of you. So do come along. Tickets are at the time recording still available. For full details, see events.wifisheep.co.uk. That's events.wifisheep.co.uk. If you haven't done so already, please do consider liking and subscribing. And as always, thank you so much for your company. I'll be back with much more real soon. Until next time, bye for now. Thank you.